other people will join. Well, thank you. Uh, another Black History Conversations. And uh, today we're going to welcoming Kate Phillips from Scotland, which is really wonderful. So just going to share the screen and I'm just going to go through our formal uh, start to the to the session. So just like that there. OK, then so you can see uh, see what we're going to be about. And we'll also be um, having a look at the current projects and our website unlocking black history so um this book sounds fantastic the scotsman said this vitally important book shows that far from being an innocent bystander scotland could hardly have been more deeply involved in the mighty historic wrong of the slave trade well, we really appreciate your time uh, joining us today, Kate. That's wonderful. But as I'm here, I'm Liz Millman from Learning Links International, currently in Australia. And because I'm here, it's the um, uh, procedure that we follow for all meetings to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently living. That's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and to their elders, past, present and the future generations. This land belongs to the sovereign people of the First Nations and was never ceded. It always was and it always will be Aboriginal land. Um, we're still um, recovering from the deep, deep disappointment that the um, recent referendum um, has continued to deny a voice to the Aboriginal people in the Australian Parliament. Quite unbelievable. Now, as with Black History Conversations, we also acknowledge the injustice of the actions taken by the British and other European countries that invaded and took possession of the islands in the Caribbean Sea, as well as the continents of North and South America. In addition, we also recognize the exploitation of the great continents of Africa, Asia, Australia and many other parts of the world in the centuries of colonisation and ongoing exploitation. We acknowledge that this has resulted in the destruction and destabilisation of so many nations, peoples and cultures. And uh, when I set this particular slide up, um, I was beginning to explore maps around the world and found this one that doesn't even include Australia. So I thought that was one to... <laughs> To recognize. Okay, now last week we had a bit of a disappointment because we were expecting Laura Trevelyan, co-founder of the Heirs of Slavery, to join us, but she wasn't able to, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later on. Oh no, now. Um, she's um, explained that she's working, it, there was a personal family reason why she couldn't join it, join last week, but she says now that she's working on a new podcast with Labour MP Clive Lewis, who I know you know Garrick, um, which launched um, last Friday, which was the day she was going to be talking with us. Now, there's lots of studio time scheduled, making it hard to fit in other UK engagements because she lives in New York. Um, but she's given us the link to the podcast there. And then she's asked if it's OK with us. She'd like to talk to our group about an archival project she's involved in, which will be aimed at digitising the early records of slavery held in Jamaica, Barbados and Antigua. So they're publicly available for a descendant communities worthwhile. Um, and I know, Jonathan, you've um, seen Laura interviewed on the TV recently when she was over in Jamaica. I don't know if you met up with her. Um, and if this is of interest to the group, she'd be glad to speak in January. So January the 29th is the date we've got her booked in for. She says that she also doesn't want to speak further about the Trevelyans and Grenada, but she doesn't think she's got anything else to say on that at present. And she has done no end of interviews. So um, you'll be able to see those I'll show in a moment. And if the archive topics of interest, she'd prefer to talk about this. So I wrote back and said, yes, yes, please. So this is about the podcasts. So there's a short two minute introduction and then she talks with Clive Lewis about going back over to Jamaica, um, to Grenada together. Um, so this is a fascinating development, um, really important. 
Okay, then the week before that, I'm not going further back than that, but we had Dr Alexander Scott join us from the International Savory Museum in Liverpool and gave a talk on from Liverpool to Lampeter <laughs> and back, Liverpool to Lampeter and back. He did go via Lancaster, I have to say, researching and curating transatlantic slavery. So that was really interesting, and we've got the recording of that session. That was a really long session. Okay, so now over to uh, Kate. And Kate, I'm going to read this out because I'm so impressed by all you've done. I hope that's all right. <laughs> so Kate's a sociology graduate from the University of Glasgow, became an international social development specialist working in Africa, Asia and the Middle East where she developed a range of partnerships for social change with community groups, members of trade unions, parliaments and political parties. Wow. And working with these partners, she conducted research, trained educators and wrote educational material, such as the role of civil groups in establishing rights and building equality. There's a lot, lot to you, Kate Phillips, I realised when I was reading this through. She began her career as a community education worker in Glasgow with a particular interest in women's lives and organisations before establishing the Active Learning Centre, which is an international charity. That worked with British government staff to analyse the causes of poverty and directed postgraduate fellowship, directed a postgraduate fellowship awarded by the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office. The fellowship is held at the University of Glasgow and it's brought rights activists from troubled countries in Africa and the Middle East to study civil organisations in Scotland. And then you've got your family, four children, ten grandchildren and one great grandchild. You're doing well. And bought and sold, Scotland, Jamaica and slavery is your first book, I gather then. And so Kate... I'm just going to pass over to you and then we've got opportunities to have a discussion afterwards. Okay, it's just going to our point and we've got it just right now, didn't we, Kate? And then I had to ask you to, there it is. Are we wow. there? Okay, right. Impressive. Really Oops. lovely, Kate. Oops, back we go. Okay. Over to you then, Kate. Thank you. Okay. Righto. So what I said, what I thought I would concentrate on today is the how white supremacy, since this is about black lives, black how white supremacy was built, because there was a period in our history when black and white were categories that we didn't know about and didn't understand. And and our division in society was between those who had um, noble blood and those who were peasants. The, the nobility looked down on the poor peasants and the peasants looked up to the nobility. But all of that changed in the 1600s. So I want to sort of take us through and look at the effects that, that have, the, the effects that we have today from this kind of First of all, to talk about Scotland's involvement, a map of Jamaica from some time ago, from the 1700s. Um, some of you will be very familiar with that. But um, just, just to um, point out that in the 1600s, late 1600s, when, when um, uh, England seized Jamaica, seized Jamaica from the Spanish and wanted to hold on to it, they they invited um, settlers. They wanted settlers to come from England and and Scotland because Scotland and England shared a king at that time. They they were not we had yet to make Britain, but in Scotland there were uh, many landed families, and only the eldest son could inherit. So many of their second, third, younger sons took up that opportunity and came and settled in Jamaica. And the places they settled in were towards the western side, the left hand of our screen, um, where, the richest, where there was very rich soil and they could settle down as planters. So the Scots first became involved when the English invited settlers and they took up that possibility. I think I have to say a word about the establishing of the Royal African Company because that was 
the first slaving company that was established in Brit in 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 England. Um, and there's a little bit of history to that, which I think is quite important. The uh, for a while we we got in the middle of the 1600s. If we, if we're going back a long time now, I know, but I think it's important. In the middle of the 1600s, we. Uh, we got rid of our royalty, and for a while we lived without any kings. We were uh, just a commonwealth, and uh, it became a military dictatorship. Um, and <clears throat> and but in the 1660s we took back royalty, and Charles II, who was the royal that we took on in the 1660s, hard bargain with the with the king and said that. Uh, you're not any longer going to have free reign in, um, in 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 your income. The only income you're going to be allowed to have is what tax you can raise from our foreign imports. So it was obviously very much in the king's interest to push up those foreign imports. And the best way to do that, as he saw it, was to establish a company that would bring labor from the west of Africa, slave labor, as the Spanish were already doing, and take that labor to the Caribbean and to the uh, and to Virginia and the um, the colonies that were already established on the west eastern borders of North America. So the 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 Royal African Company came into being, and. Uh, they they thought they had a very good deal because although the planters had no very little money uh, in, in those who settled themselves in Jamaica, they had very little money. The Royal African Company promised that they would deliver the slaves to them and they could be paid for at a later date in the products of uh, the products of Jamaica, if we concentrate on Jamaica at this point. So the king needed funds. He was going to deliver. Um, he was going to deliver enslaved people to work in the plantations. And the plantation owners could pay for them in the sugar. And uh, in Virginia, it would be the cotton and tobacco that they produced. There was only, and that it seemed like a good deal for the merchants who were investing in the Royal African Company. send the sugar and the cotton and the tobacco as they promised. They often found other people to buy their goods at a better price. And consequently, the Royal African Company went absolutely bankrupt with massive debts. Um, the king was very upset about this, obviously, and went to Parliament and demanded that the, uh, the, the, the Parliament helped because we, there was a problem in English law if they wanted to reclaim these debts, you could reclaim debts on goods, but people, buying and selling people, people were not recognized as goods. And he wanted a change in the law. He wanted the, the people that they were buying and selling to be classed as goods. Parliament said no, that would utterly uh, undermine all of the uh, rights of English people or the basis of English law. But the king went behind Parliament's back and got lawyers to agree that people could be classed as goods. So chattel slavery was born. And by that, we mean classing people as goods, which made a huge difference. They relaunched the Royal African Company. And from then on, those who didn't pay up with their sugar and cotton could be taken to court and the money could be reclaimed. Now, because um, this is a, 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 these pictures, I should say, were produced as a bit of propaganda. So we should, although they show us a beautiful, uh, the beautiful scenery of Jamaica, I'll point out in a moment why they're propaganda. But you see that the, the this is planting sugar on the plantations, and you can see they're marking out the hillside in squares. This is very, it was very important to the planters because they knew exactly how much sugar they had to send to Britain to pay back their debts. Now, at the time when I'm talking about in the 1700s, um, you could buy a person, a worker, an enslaved worker for about equivalent of about 17 pounds in money, which was 2,400 pounds of raw sugar. 
So you knew that your enslaved person had to pay for themselves in that enslaved sugar. So you marked out the hillside and you knew exactly how much each person had to produce. So the planters were under pressure, pay back the debts, make sure the people that had indebted, they were indebted for, paid back in the next two, three years. I say that it's a, a piece of propaganda because what we do know is that um, all of the slave lists that I looked at showed that the majority of the field workers, the field gang, was majority, at least half, and if not more, it was, the majority of them were female. But since this was the, this picture was made for the British population to show them that all was happy and well in the colonies, um, they were they were uh, and and they were very sensitive about women being forced to work in fields. They, we we have very very few women in the line up there in the field gang. The other thing that we know is that they from from accounts at the time that they they worked uh, stripped to the waist, and that was because if you see the man in the foreground, he has a whip to keep up the pace of the work. They whipped the slaves' backs, and they wouldn't be whipping this clothing, which they they since the planters bought the slaves clothing they wouldn't be tearing the clothing to pieces with a whip so we know very well that that's not quite what it looked like but there's one other thing i'd like to point out and that's their blue trousers and this is a nice little point that i like um africans brought with them a, a knowledge of how to do, of dying with indigo they brought a lot of skills and a lot of knowledge with them not only how to plant in tropical soils and how to make the basket that we can see on the left hand of the picture but also how to use indigo and they died that um, the, i read accounts of the fact that they the 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 linen clothing that they were given uh, was very drab and they tended to dye it with the indigo and make it into diet blue and they called it blue jeans. So if you thought the Americans invented blue jeans, I don't think so. This is um, getting in the harvest. And um, if we look at the, uh, if we look at the man on the horse in the foreground, um, he's most likely to be a Scot because Scots were preferred for the, the, the plantation manager's job, which was called bookkeeper. Um, we had a good education system in the 1700s, also a very strong Protestant work ethic. And it meant that the young men from Scotland were preferred for this job. So he was likely to be a Scot. Um, <clears throat> the linen clothing that, um, that, that the enslaved people are wearing mostly came from Scotland. It was worth about £700,000 to the Scottish economy. We made a very rough linen clothing, which wasn't, as people became more sophisticated in Europe, it wasn't suitable for sheets and whatever, and, and European clothing. But it was very hard wearing, and they shipped it out to Jamaica. It employed 170,000 Scots in the latter part of the 1700s. It was... A, a, just about our most important export export so masses of scottish working lives depended on it this, these um these enslaved people were fed on salted smoked herrings hence salt fish and aki which should the national dish of jamaica but it, it was a the, the, this salted fish was of huge, huge importance to the Scottish economy too, particularly for those rural people who lived around the shores of Scotland and um, around, especially around the, the the west coast. So the herring fishing and the the fed the enslaved people and the clothing that they wore, as well as so many other things like hose that were sent out and. Um, uh, were, were of great importance to the Scottish economy, apart from the actual enslaving of people. Now we're looking down here on this, another piece of propaganda, how calm and uh, lovely it looks. But what we're actually looking at is looking down on Kingston, um, Jamaica, which became the 
biggest slave distribution center in the world. Uh, it, it, we wouldn't think it from what we're looking at. Um, now, what the, the produce of Jamaica and the produce of Virginia, sugar and tobacco, we're very clear that those, those nowadays, both of those things are addictive. And once people tasted sugar, smoked tobacco, they wanted more. So the, uh, the, those who took up land in Jamaica were able to pay back in sugar for the enslaved workers within two, three years, if they were lucky. And then because they had been, these workers had been classed as things, as goods, they were remortgageable. The law which made them chattel slaves made them mortgageable property. And so they could remortgage the ones they had in order to buy fresh slaves. So um, th there was a so this underpinned the very rapid expansion in the production of sugar, the production of tobacco in Virginia, and the expansion of the whole industry of enslaving Africans and bringing them across the sea to work. A little map of uh, Britain. It was some surprise to me to learn that actually when 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 boats were crossing the Atlantic, they went up round the top of Ireland and the British Isles. They went up round the top rather than down round the bottom. There were two reasons for that. One is that if you think about the curvature of the earth, if they left from Scotland, um, the journey across the Atlantic was two weeks shorter going and the same coming back, which saved an awful lot in terms of water and food and everything else. The other reason was that because Britain um, was a, a, a Protestant, a staunchly Protestant nation, it was often at war with its nearest neighbours on the continent, France and Spain, and that made the Straits of Dover in the southeastern corner of our map rather dangerous place to be taking a ship loaded with uh, with goods. So the um, all of the goods I've said I said I, I said earlier that the king was making his living from taxing imports. Now as the slave as the slave trade grew, those slave traders in West Africa became quite sophisticated in their tastes and what they wanted to exchange for the people they were they were they were exchanging so what they wanted was iron ore from sweden they wanted the lovely colored cotton cloth and silks which came from india they wanted brandy from france maybe rum too and tobacco so what they were what they were loading the ships with were imported goods. Now, Scotland had another advantage there because the, the tax on imported goods was high, but in the, in the Scotland was a little bit off the beaten track and all of those little uh, ports of Scotland and also the Isle of Man, which is sits between Ireland and England, that part of the world was a very good place for avoiding paying taxes on all of these goods. I've marked out Campbelltown there. Can you see that in white? Now, Campbelltown is on the end of Kintyre, the mull of Kintyre, in fact, as the song some of you may know. <laughs> um, Campbelltown uh, was a little village uh, of just a thousand or so people, but grew very rapidly during the 1700s because it found itself on that main route out to um, slave route. When we talk about, I'll show you something else in a minute to make it clearer. But they were on the they were on the slave route, and um, the slave in slave ships regularly um, called there to load up with these tax free goods, the iron ore, the silks, the tobacco that they uh, that they were going to exchange for enslaved people. Campbelltown doubled in size, trebled in size, became a place of 7,000 people with, in, incidentally, almost 500 men and boys fishing, um, fishing for the oily fish that was to be sent to feed the enslaved people. And they set up many whiskey distilleries, which were sending the alcohol that, uh, uh, that 
that could go on to be exchanged for enslaved people down in West Africa. So Campbelltown um, was shipping out a lot of Scottish goods. I had a look into this just, just to give you an idea of how small places in Scotland were involved in the whole business. I had a look at the town councillors of Campbelltown in the late 1700s. Now, this is Mr. Hyburn. He bought ships, he bought uh, shares in a couple of slaving ships, the Dolphin and the Happy Return. Now, the, the, the numbers you can see there, the, um, uh, the numbers in that you can see there uh, the, in black show the number of people that were shipped by the that, that they carried and the ones at the bottom show the ones that actually arrived so you can see for those from those numbers uh about getting on for 20 percent of the men women and children that they took on board were thrown overboard either because they died in the passage from west africa to to kingston or they became too uh ill to be worth uh, uh, transporting and trying to sell and they were thrown overboard. So here's the Stuarts, another town councillor um, with shares in three ships, Betty, Isabella and Peggy. The Harvey family, another family with shares in ships all in this small town. Duncan Ballantyne with shares in the Swan, Eagle, Hope. Thousands, as you can see, of people shipped by these uh by these families in Campbelltown now I don't want to particularly say oh Campbelltown was a slaving place what I'm saying is that if you, you can do this for so many of the small towns around the Scottish coast Campbelltown uh the councillors controlled the port and they've could control the shipping that came in and out and also could control how much tax was paid on the goods that was loaded onto the or that was were loaded onto these ships but i can't if we just count those few councillors 133,275 people shipped from africa 22,656 were thrown overboard before they reached kingston but we could do this for whole number of small towns. Now, Duncan Ballantyne didn't own the Swan, the Eagle and the Hope. He was one of a consortia of people who had shares in these ships. So all around Scotland, we would find people with shares in these ships. Um, if we if we draw some of this, that what I've been saying so far together. So on the left hand side of our diagram, we have the plantations. This is my version of the what we call the triangular trade. But we have the plantations in Jamaica. They send their orders for, um, for enslaved people to the merchants in Scotland. The, they, the merchants in Scotland check them out and give them a credit note so that they can bid in the slave market. And once they've got the orders in, the merchants in Scotland look for investors uh, who are going to invest in the boats and buy in all the imports, the iron, the silk cloth, the cotton cloth, the alcohol and whatever else. They're going to take down the goods that are going to go to West Africa uh, and, uh, and be exchanged with the traders in West Africa for the human cargoes that are going to go to Kingston. Now, in the late 1700s, Glasgow established its Glasgow the University of Glasgow has established its medical school and the universities of Inverness and also um no Aberdeen sorry and and Edinburgh expanded theirs because in order to try well, from the figures I've just shown you you can see that almost 20 percent of the enslaved people didn't make it across the Atlantic. Now, the merchants saw that as a 20% loss in their profits, and they uh, they they wanted to, uh, it eventually it became legal that they had to, but they were wanting to employ doctors to go on board the ships. Uh, they also thought that the doctors could help the traders in the trade in West Africa by selecting the strongest and healthiest looking of the enslaved people. So those are, we come to the slave market 
and the plantations. And the tobacco, the sugar, the cotton is sent back to the merchants for processing and for resale to other parts of Europe. So if we look at the merchants in Scotland and how they made the huge amounts of money that they made, they made it from processing the tobacco, the sugar, the cotton. And anybody who any when history claims that a certain family were cotton merchants or sugar merchants or tobacco merchants, they were highly, highly likely to also be slave merchants because the two things went together. You paid for you 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 bought your slaves by paying in tobacco, sugar and cotton. So anybody who's receiving that is likely to be involved in the rest of the triangle. So they're involved in the processing of all that, all those uh, colonial goods. They're involved in making money from the investors who invested in the ships. They're involved in the trading in the human cargoes and all of that right-hand side of the diagram, if we want to think of it in this way, is dependent on the plantations that we see on the left side of my diagram. Now, this is how I like to think about it. it. The plantations, the people who are actually working to produce the sugar in Jamaica, and as a feminist, I have to say, most of them teenage girls, are holding up this whole rest of the commercial um, risks and, uh, and, and investments and, and profits that are being made in Scotland. So the, the tobacco merchants, the sugar merchants, the cotton merchants, they're all dependent on these people in the plantations. So it's very necessary to, it, it was thought very necessary to protect their profits by um, inventing new legislation. Now, initially, uh, the in this is the list of legislation. Initially, in 1681, um, white workers, uh, Britain, the, both in Scotland and in England, uh, worked uh, the unemployed, the vagrants, uh, criminals, whatever, were rounded up, and legislation was passed to ship them out to the colonies to work. So initially white workers were shipped out, but by 1681, uh, legislation was passed to encourage white people voluntarily to go. Um, they were not to be naked, stripped naked and whipped, and they were to be given minimum levels of clothing and food. So this is the first time in law, apart from the chattel slavery law, that the that white people are going to be white skinned people are going to be treated differently to black skinned people. These are new categories. We didn't think in those terms before. 1717, it's a, a new legislation to this is when, um, because terror tactics become part of the legislation, it becomes legal to cut off the feet of runaways, not white runaways, but only black ones. And also because of the fear of uh, black people, of the enslaved people getting together, so they should be whipped for playing dice, dice and cards, no keeping of horses and mules. That, that That's all about the making money because they were given a plot of land to grow their food. Uh, it, it was felt that if they kept horses, mules or whatever and bred them there, then they'd be able to make money. Uh, and we bring in the carrying of certificates or tickets to show they need permission to move about from the plantation where they're owned. So we begin to restrict black people in a way that we're not, not restricting white workers. Because of fears of possible revolts, and there were many, Drumming and gathering together is forbidden. Um, revolts went on continuously and they took some days to put down. And there were troops stationed in the island in order to do that. 1730, we see the restrictions on jobs, um, tavern keepers and whatever. Uh, it soon became obvious to the to uh, the white people in Jamaica that actually they could teach their slaves to do all sorts of jobs, be carpenters and, and bricklayers and masons and iron workers and, of course, sugar boilers. So the 
it, it legislation was brought in to ensure that w there were enough white people. There was always a, a fear because they, the white people were vastly outnumbered by those they enslaved. There's always a fear there are not enough white people. So restrictions were brought in to make sure that some of those skilled jobs were retained for, for white people. And also that every uh, small community should set up a militia which could go out immediately and put down rebellious slaves that would they would have a st stash of armaments and they would go out and put down because to get your soldiers from one side of the island over the mountains to the other side of the island was going to take time and they could see that actually their their enslaved people were not going to be peacefully enslaved they were had a problem and they needed to control it in 1747, the enslaved were not allowed to give evidence in court except against fellow slaves. And if you should, you see, a plantation owner, if he had a mortgage on an enslaved man or woman, he would be reluctant to uh, punish severely or execute that person. Uh, as he was allowed to do if they misbehaved in, as part of the kind of terror tactics that were in place, um, it, the parish would pay compensation. So you were in, they were encouraged to, um, if they executed one of their enslaved people, they could claim compensation. So we'd see a raft of legislation, both to terrorize and to hold in place the enslaved people, but to treat a black skin differently to a white skin. There was one problem with, with this. Um, if we, James Stewart was a, an Edinburgh man who, who was, went out to Jamaica to write an account. Uh, I mean, really, it was supposed to be an account of how peaceful uh, the island was and how productive and, you know, to, to give us a, a, because it was so, it was, enslaving people was always controversial from the first moment that it was, that um, the Royal African Company was launched. And consequently, there was a, a, a continuing need for all kinds of propaganda, which came back to Britain to say, it isn't what you think it is. It's a peaceful place. It's a, uh, and, and um, the, the enslaved people are properly looked after and whatever. Anyway, James Stewart went out to write one of those accounts and there are many of them. Um, he went out to write and he, he noted because he was a kind of um, staunch Presbyterian, as many Scots were, that in fact, every man, as he put it, has his black mistress. If you owned women, you could do what you liked with them. So the level of abuse was enormous. But between some, uh, there were relationships. A man could, the usual way to establish something a little bit more permanent was to rent a, rent a black woman to rent an enslaved woman if she if she didn't belong to you obviously if she belonged to you you could do what you liked but if she didn't belong to you then you usually paid a rental to her owner and your any children she had would also have to be rented from the owner because uh, the children of a slave belong to a slave and it was a complicated and very expensive process to free uh to free a, a, an enslaved woman and also you always had the, the the sanction or they they always had the sanction that if they if if the, they were renting a woman and the relationship was not going well you could always put her back in the slave pool and choose another one to rent so but the result of that was as he James Stewart reported uh, that a numerous race has sprung up, which goes by the general appellation of people of colour. There were thousands, tens of thousands of colour, people of colour who were the children of Scottish fathers. And that's why I say um, that Jamaica is very closely related to us, because if you look at the numbers, it's um, in such a small island, it's obvious that we're, the, the concentration of the Scottish gene pool is rather greater than it would have been in Canada or Australia. This, uh, if 
if these Scottish fathers, many of them sent their children home, some of their children home, a few, you know, just a, those their favourites, home to Scotland to be educated, many of them used them to look after their uh, property in Jamaica when they when they went home. They were often absentee, leaving those people of colour, their children of colour, in charge. This disturbed the Jamaican um, the Jamaican government because it didn't keep up, as they put it, the distinction that must be kept up in this island between white persons and Negroes, and therefore their issue and offspring must be must be kept in their place. Any property allocation, any education, any um, any anything like that would destroy that distinction. So the children of colour had to go home. If they were going to be schooled at all, had to go home to Scotland to be schooled. And uh, many of the schools in Scotland saw children of colour, little village schools, lots of reports and um, uh, in Scotland of that. And the um, should they leave them any money or give their daughter a, a dowry or whatever, this was limited to make sure that they never would uh, could challenge or enter into the the the, the white classes. Now, all of this time that I've been talking about, the 1700s, there had been voices, anti-slavery voices from the very beginning. And throughout the 1700s, there were all kinds of uh, voices raised uh, against, the, the, um, against enslavement. And there were campaigns to end the trade. I think we know that the trade ended in 1807. But the Towards the end of the 1700s, those voices became much more organized and campaigns became much more strident. This is a, a, a small poster from that time. Um, but it's interesting in the way that it shows the African man absolutely stripped of his culture, his history, his skills, um, his humanity. And by then that had been to a certain extent achieved, never wholly successfully. But that's but this is the picture which is being presented to uh to people in in Britain. In the in 1807, the slave trade is abolished. By 18 um in the 1820s, the under pressure from the um anti-slavery campaign the British government begins to discuss the possibility of returning some of the some rights to enslaved people. And this greatly disturbed um, those. I'll just read I'll just read these what was proposed a rough to you. The, the, the parliament began discussing and passed legislation that was going to allow slave, enslaved people to observe the Sabbath, it was abolishing the use of the whip, it was abolishing flogging of female slaves, it was inflicting, um, it was preventing uh, planters uh, inflicting their own punishments uh, without going to court for serious, uh, serious crimes. It was to encourage marriage, it was to uh, uh, regulate the sale of slaves. It was to allow slaves to have property. Um, it, a lot of the things which had been stripped away, a lot of the rights that had been slipped away, stripped away were to be returned to them, which of course greatly alarmed the Jamaican Assembly. And they, when the instructions were sent out to say that this is what Parliament has agreed, this is what the King has agreed, the Jamaican Assembly absolutely refused to implement this legislation. Um, and that, this is taken from the Glasgow Herald, or Scottish Papers in, the, in 1826, um, 16th of June. Um, it's interesting now that this is a petition that's been sent to the West, Westminster Parliament uh, from the Jamaican Assembly. Um, and it now describes the sla our slaves as a contented, a race of people. They're a di the, the black is now a different race. 
and what, what so they claim, a contented race, which is in need of protection and support, which they get. If they're obedient, they get from their masters. And they are um, they, they, they are threatening that this will be the destruction of the colonies, et cetera, et cetera. I did note that the man signing it, David Finlayson, and the Speaker of the House of Assembly uh, in December 1826, was a Scot, and he himself had Jamaican children. Um, the house up above is the house of the, uh, is Paul Tallach House in Argyll. Um, and this, the, this uh, I've got a couple of illustrations of these country houses. The men who, the families who went out to Jamaica in the early 1700s kept their plantations and often they returned home and they sent out generations of their family, or of their, either younger sons or nephews or, 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 or friends of the family to run the estates in Jamaica while they lived at home. Now they now describe themselves as art collectors. And they what we do know from the research is that um, it, that whatever else they invested their money in, they, they, the, the income from their uh, projects in Jamaica, from their involvement in, the, in, in, in slavery was always the key, uh, the, the largest, the majority of their funds coming in. And it's, that's what built um, this beautiful house. I've got another one here. There are many, many of them. They're very easy to track in Scotland because they often called them the same name. The one in Jamaica and the one in Scotland um, will often have a link to uh, names that are linked. So you can just uh, Google them and up they come. Um, here's another one. Now, um, this is Gartmore House, just to the north of Glasgow. Now, another family who started off the, the the family, he, the, this one started off as actually as, as cattle traders, and they started off in Jamaica with cattle. Um, this one with small, medium sized farmers. Now they have this massive pile. Um, and they, uh, the West Indian merchants also um, lobbied Parliament. And this is from the debate in Parliament in 1826. Um, that saying that land in the colonies would be worth nothing if it's de deprived of its laborers, which is true, um, and that uh, all of our all of our securities, all all of our shares and stocks in this uh, business would be nearly valueless if if as as prop transferable property, if you bring in this legislation to give the enslaved people more human rights. And they're very, they're very, very clear um, that they're, that uh, the lack of human rights is actually uh, linked to their uh, the the money they're making. Now, <clears throat> in 1832, oh, I should say yes. I'm going to read you a little, another little piece. Whilst they were, let's just go back to this. Whilst they were protesting that the Slaves were a contented race of people um, in Jamaica. At the very same time, I just want to read you what was going on in Jamaica in the summer of 1826, because the enslaved people um, in the knew exactly what was going on. They knew that the British government had given them rights. They knew that the Jamaican uh, assembly was debating this and refusing to implement it, and um, and a, a, a revolt broke out on those Scottish estates in the west of Jamaica that um, I pointed out, um, and the revolutionary spirit was only finally suppressed by the appearance of a major general commanding a large and well-armed detachment of the 92nd Regiment. In the Scottish press, you could receive you, you could read um, a gallant account of how the uh, slave revolt was put down. But this is at the very moment when they're claiming that they are a contented race of people if you don't interfere with them and start um, telling them they've got rights. 
Governor Manchester, who was responsible for trying to get the legislation implemented, he reported that some of the slaves from Argyle Estate, um, in particular three, John Clark, John Miller and Ben Reynolds, killed themselves, stating that they preferred to die as free men rather than be captured and killed as slaves. And the court in the town of Lucia tried 11 men from Argyle Estate and seven from Golden Grove. They executed 13. And at the request of John Malcolm, this is his house we're looking at now on the screen. At the request, request of John Malcolm, the, the, John Malcolm was the son of this household. At his, at his request, the court decreed that the 11 men from Argyle should be hanged publicly in John Malcolm's mill yard. And there were horrible scenes as the brave Argyle slaves attempted to rescue their fellow captives. Now, although John Clark, John Miller and Ben Reynolds and the unnamed 11 gained nothing from the revolt against their masters, they did gain a lot of respect in their community. They chose to die as free men and they spoke bravely of the continued fight for rights and justice. And they called on their fellow slaves to continue the war, even if they, as they went to their deaths. They were remembered by the surviving slaves because Argyle became a name, a byword for resistance. So that Argyle took on a whole new meaning. Now, finally, I just want to say, that those revolts continued until, um, until the British government became quite convinced that the whole, that Jamaica was ungovernable. And by 1832, um, we had the, uh, what, what became known as the Baptist revolt, the final revolt on the Jamaican side. But at the same time, um, in 1832, we had a, ref a reform of the franchise, and that reform widened the, the voting. Um, the the, the, the um, those who, the, the the numbers of people who had a vote in Britain, and all of those throughout the 1700s, uh, this, the the pro-slavery lobby had held the places in the Parliament. They made sure that they had places in the parliament. In 1832, they were absolutely swept out. And so on one side, you've got an ungo the ungovernable uh, situation in Jamaica. On the other side, you have the pro-slavery lobby swept out of the parliament. And that ended the whole process legally. So I, I, I would like to stress legally because the law was changed. The legal battle was won. But I think if you look at the um, those um, illustrations in newspapers and elsewhere celebrating the end of slavery, we can see that the propaganda war has not been won, that the white people are casting themselves as the angels and the saviors who have um, ended slavery without any reference to what has been going on in Jamaica. Uh, so they're the saviors and the and the 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 uh, the black race, as they are called in uh, a lot of the literature, are now ripe and ready to receive to become uh, to to be um, converted to a new culture, to be civilized or whatever. And so we're, we've got the legislation, we've got the propaganda, and um, we're absolutely ready to export it to the colonies, if I can put it that way. I'll finish there if that's, um, uh, thank you. I hope I haven't gone on too long. No, Kate, that was absolutely brilliant. There's been a little conversation going on the chat saying, wow, this is amazing. Amazing. We need to ask lots of questions. So um, I think uh, I don't know. Do you want to to stop sharing your screen and then? I'll t uh, yes, I can do that. Uh, let me stop sharing the screen. Yes. All right. Okay then. So oh, hang on a minute. I'm, wow. I've got. No, nope, I need to escape. Don't I? Out of this. Right. Mm. You're fine now. This is good. Really good.
Yes. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. so sorry, yeah. I, hope, I hope I didn't go on too long. I just wanted to take you through that what looking at Scotland told me about the whole situation and that so I hope it's it, the illustrations help you too absolutely amazing really really helpful um I'm going to ask Joan first because she's got her hand up first and then Vivian I'm coming to you because it would be really good to uh, to get uh, perspectives or questions from you so can Sorry, we ask was, Joan was... first though Vivian ask Joan first Joan, are you all right? Oh, yes, yeah. Um, I'm even going to put my camera on. I'm just quickly getting myself respectable. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that this has been so fantastic. I mean, you know, some really good history and just, you know, I, I, this is what they need to be teaching in schools. Rather than getting into a blame game, they need to just teach what actually happened. Anyway, um, the question I have is, um, do you know a little bit more about how Charles, Charles II um, was able to sort of redefine Black people as... As, as chattels when Parliament has said he shouldn't do that? Well, uh, we ha it's, it's partly to do with how English law works because we can have precedents in the courts. Uh -huh. and I'm a lawyer, he... by the way. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Next yeah, OK. So, so, yeah. So, so that's how he used it. He went to the courts and... He, mm -hmm. This is they they use this process okay. in uh, uh, to, to get I would say corrupt lawyers to get lawyers to agree um, okay. and to to help them out. But it was it was I think it's 1737 that Parliament actually considered the question again, and so much money was at stake that they actually passed some legislation. Although I haven't been able to find I've seen reference to it, I haven't been able to find the wording of it. Just on your point about schools, I am trying to talk to school children and to talk to teachers about the school curriculum. It's easier for children to understand, you know, if you can mm. take down away from numbers and whatever and talk about if you'd been there, this is what you would have seen. Mm. This is what would have happened. What would you have mm. thought? Mm. Um, yeah. Do you know the case that the king brought? You don't happen to know the name of the case. No, I don't. Okay. I don't. I don't know that detail. I'm sorry okay. to say. That's, okay. no, that's fine. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm, I'm thrilled. Thank you. Great, Jen. Vivian, would you like to comment I now? Yield, I yield to Garrick because his hand, like and mine, Garrick. at the same space. <laughs> it takes a little time for me to get over this, so I yield to Garrick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just to say, you know, oh, it's a very emotive subject, and yes. your presentation um, was very enlightening. Um, and sometimes, you know, you, you, you've actually brought the whole thing to life in, mm -hmm. in, in, in how you presented. Um, I was listening carefully, and I was hoping that you would say something about Scotland um, slave merchant account for about 50 percent mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of the slave market you know that, mm -hmm. that's a mm -hmm. huge that's it a is. huge number it is it is and and it's true what you're saying um I found when I was uh, maybe can I just give you a little bit of history I, I went to Jamaica for a holiday I'm retired. I went with my husband and we stayed sort of bed and breakfast in Jamaican homes and we traveled on the buses and so many people we met seemed to have Scottish names. Mm. I was ignorant. I knew nothing. Mm. And um, uh, I and I also was puzzled by the idea when I went into shops about the tins of oily fish. And I thought, why on earth would they be eating that when they've got other sorts of fish in their own water. There were all sorts of clues that because of my international experience made me think, what went on here? I clearly don't know. So I went home and the more I looked and the more I found, I actually had nightmares for quite a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm now able to talk dispassionately and maybe that's not a good thing but I had nightmares about what I found I mean we stayed in houses where they said do you eat porridge or when they knew we came from Scotland I, I, I just realized that I met so many people who said they were Scots that they were descended from Scots they're Scottish more Scottish than me I'm descended from English people I only lived there um at, 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 I, and yet we don't 
we don't celebrate that. We we had a homecoming for mm. for the diaspora of Scottish people. I don't think Jam Jamaica was invited. Yeah, but the, the, the uh, thing is, Kate, you know, um, my own family, um, part of my family is Maroons. Um, yes, from yes. West Africa, from Ashanti, Ghana, etc. Yeah, yeah. And the other part of my family is from India. Yes. But my father was born in Aberdeen, in Jamaica. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and and yes. the very first visit to the UK, he wanted to see Aberdeen, the place. So yes. I took him to Scotland to see mm. Aberdeen. Mm. Um, and a lot of our um, generation people don't know their roots in terms of where they yes. came from. And clearly our history doesn't give us that, that, that longer period. We, we, we only have got period relating to slave and ownership. And so mm. those mm. names that a lot of people have are slave mm. names. You know, they belong to plantation, yeah, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, but we haven't yes. got um, you know African names, etc. Um, yes, and one of the one of the things that we have spoken about on this platform mm. around Black History conversation is about how we begin to have those conversation that is not focusing on Black history, but more about British history. Yes. Right? yes. Because we, we, we don't want to keep cutting history into, into little pigeons. No, no, no. So, so the British history, which should be taught in school to include what you've just presented, for example. Yes. Um, and um, in Wales, for example, the curriculum is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, and we're still pushing to get the, 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 you know, the English curriculum to be, to be more uh, inclusive. But, you know, the, the 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 information you presented, it it it's good for us, but sometimes I think it's it's the wrong people is going to. We we need to we need to challenge this information to educators, for example, you know, yes. so that they can um, you know change the way they present history and the way they engage with these conversations. Yeah, I think because I. I was putting together this place, Jamaica, and this place, Scotland. I ended up with this joint picture. I had been, the, the picture I'd been given in the past was something about slavery, but also about, um, you know, we solved it. We resolved it. We, we British people resolved it. We didn't worry about it anymore. And I, I, that's what I've been taught. Mm -hmm. um, but when I put it all together, I could see how, how we we designed the whole thing, how it affected our lives. But what did, disturbed me most was that we won that legal battle, perhaps, between us, the people in Jamaica and the people in Britain. But we didn't, the propaganda war, which had reduced, stripped people with a black skin well, from all their culture and history and skills and knowledge and cleverness, which actually brought slavery down, let's admit it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we, we didn't learn about that. No. And, they, and, and we don't, that's, that has an effect to this day on people like me who were raised to believe those things. Yeah. So for yeah. me, it was a, it was a, a fundamental um, rethink of of what I th how I thought the world worked and what I thought about the world. I don't want to go further, yeah. but maybe yeah. I'm just. Yeah. I, I went I went through a period of, and I I then wanted to share that. I have been touring around Scotland, working very hard with community groups and children. And anybody who wants to listen, I'll give them this. Well, you, you, did, you did a thing, Black as Remind. You was in Edinburgh because I I read the article you presented in Edinburgh. Ah. Edinburgh. Your book, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it yeah. was well received. Mm. Yeah, I, I've done a lot of public speaking, especially to those small communities in the West Coast. I've been to Campbelltown to tell them about their exactly what I've talked to you about today. Mm. And I'm going to go to another one right. next week. What was their reaction, Kate? To They you? were 
they were very shocked, very shocked. They had no idea that Campbelltown was built on slavery. Um, but what they did do afterwards was say, I think we need a panel for our museum and would you like to write it? So there is an openness beginning and they they were happy for me to, some of them were defective Intensive initially and um, upset by what I had to say, but they then then did accept <laughs> that I should make a panel for their museum. So I have uh, with some of the information that I've given you today. But I could I I could do that for most of the small towns on the west coast. I went to their archives. Uh, you know, because I couldn't find the historical material I wanted, I thought it must be somewhere. Um, I went to the library. Our libraries have uh, local archives. And I asked them, do you have any, any you know, um, letters or information about this family or that family? Oh, yes, they did. And when I read their their letters, sure enough, there, there was there was letters coming from Jamaica, going back to Jamaica. And of course, the the because they were they had to get a certain amount of sugar back. They were often, you know, about how much production and all this because the money money never left Britain. Money was collected in Britain only the and the goods and the people uh, circulated the earth, but the money stayed right there. Yeah. Uh, you made two really important points in the the goods. You referred to the sugar and the tobacco. Yes. Uh, being addictive. And yes. clearly you can see how, uh, you know, the economies of the world um, yes. are actually, you know, how that has been supported um, and how, how, you know, um, sugar goods, for example, and all the products, um, you know, which we know is addictive and it, it leads to, to decay and other stuff, etc. Yeah. And that has continued regardless because it is a continuation of profit and money yes 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 but it but you can see why why when you look at, at the the graph of how the sugar production and the and the tobacco production climbed and the number of slaves that had to match it mm. um you see that and you think well yes that's to do with addiction it's to do with the compulsive nature of people mm. wanting sugar and tobacco it wasn't any old um, product. It was something that hooked people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that then that led to all sorts of health issues, which we yes. now see. Mm. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Garrick. I mean, I'm sure you could ask many other things. I'm coming back to you, Vivian, as I'd invited you earlier to comment. It, I found this quite, quite overwhelming. The amount of factual information i had no idea that the small communities along the west coast of scotland were involved in any way in the trade and yet you were able to explain it so clearly so vivian have you got any comments that you want to make well wow. well i wasn't prepared for this but i don't think any of us were <laughs> hey i wasn't prepared for it but i Kate, I want to thank you most sincerely. I thought I'd heard it all, but I thank you most sincerely because fortuitously for us, this is the 185th anniversary of our ancestors being given a surname. And ah. my surname, Crawford, you know the connection. Mm. So it is fortuitous, but my wish Every day we wake up with a wish. Mm. I'm having nightmare and daymares. Night and day, it's nightmare and daymare. Because my wish as a Jamaican, my wish is that our country could stand still and everybody turns on to this Zoom presentation. You said any property, any education must be kept in place. Yes. Stripped of history, color humanity. 
In my research, I saw where the director of education in 1900 said that the boys should be doing school garden. Now, this is an agricultural country. Why another? Why not another skill? Why it had to do with school garden? Mm. And I researched mm. that his own daughter was sent to England, where she studied, then on to Oxford, and she mm -hmm. became a medical doctor. Wish them well, because she was able to return to Jamaica in 1951 to help with vomiting sickness. We're stripped of our history, color humanity. We must know our place because acculturation was imposed on us. Mm. Mm. A British school teacher told one of our famous educators who became vice chancellor at the University of the West Indies, as a child, Sir Philip Sherlock asked that he be exposed to some Jamaican West Indian history. And he was told, boy, you have no history. Of course, the rest is history. So it is, it is, it, it, it is just so moving what you are taking us through. Next week, the 23rd, is the birth date of Mary C. Cole. And that's for another mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. You spoke about the torture of enslaved. And there are many enslaved who were tortured. And the name of one, James Knight, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he was caught, caught teaching other enslaved to say their prayers that the Moravians in 1753 had invited people from Europe to come and teach us. Mm, mm. And he was caught. They pursued him. He was at a place near Mandeville. They mm. pursued him to Comfort Hall. When he heard, he ran to St. Elizabeth. He was caught, his head decapitated, put on a pole, and they marched from um, Black River to mm -hmm. a place called Mile Gully and hoisted his head on the pole for others to see what would happen to them. James Knight's descendant became the 13th Bishop of Jamaica, Alfred Reed. Finally, to say with regard to education, it was only 1978, Kate, that the parish of Trelawney mm -hmm. had a school where boys could have direct access. Before wow. that, they had to travel miles to get into a high school. They, before that, in the 1890s, girls had access to a school, Westwood, because the person who founded it, Reverend Webb, he couldn't get his two girls into schools in Kingston, the schools then. But had had Trelawney a high school before 1978, how many more Usain Bolts there would be? Because mm. Usain Bolt went to that school, that 1978 established school, William Nib Memorial High School, and of course, world famous. So this is really heavy stuff. It is. This is really heavy stuff. It is. And I am really, really grateful to you. I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. Thank it you, is Vivian. It's truly heavy stuff, this. And I hope that, um, you know, we're meeting you for the first time, Kate. Um, we've been running Black History Conversations since way back in. 2020 when we started in October 2020 and we've had many many speakers but I have to say your presentation was exceptional because you were able to express so clearly in everyday language your terminology helped us to really really understand something that I don't think anybody here knew before about this particular um, positioning of history, talking about two places. Mm, One of the things mm. we have found is that the two places that 
local black history is very important. It's very mm. important for communities mm. Mm. to look at and address their own history. But then it's important for others to understand the black histories of our countries mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom, but also to understand the impact and the the histories from other countries. And mm. when David Alston came to talk with us, he talked a lot about Guyana because a lot of mm. Scots were mm. there as well. Yes. So it is really interesting. And but also it's what you've done is something that can can be applied in in a in various ways. I wish we'd got you in Wales to tell the story so straightforwardly. We have a, a story in Wales that we're studying at the moment and I'm I'm talking here just for a moment. We're studying mm. the story of the Penance family. Yes. But we don't know any of this sort of detail that you were talking about. And the Pennant family, um, they were um Richard Pennant was um an MP for Liverpool mm. and he was one mm. of the uh, one of the anti abolitionists. Mm. But you were mm. able to explain things in such a you're a lovely down to earth person, but we were also looking at it from you know the 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 reality point of view and this business about the different laws that change people to to be able to be be property i mean this i understood it had happened but i didn't know how and but you've mm. explained it which is magnificent i'm just going to see if my colleague jonathan greenland who's also joining us from jamaica jonathan's the uh, director of the museum of jamaica oh right he's around at the moment he might have nipped off to Oh, there you are, Jonathan. <laughs> well, I'm okay. here. I'm here, all right. Um, Hello, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Kate. I hope we, we can stay in contact, actually. And um, and Liz is, as usual, the person to coordinate us all. Um, so I'd love to be in contact with you because I do have some quite detailed questions, which I'm not going to go into now. But um, I think that would be a very nice thing to do if we could. I, I, I would be delighted to um, talk a bit further with you and and because I'm sure the I always learn something when I give talks um because people come up with their picture their side of things and and that that can be it, it helps me to put yeah, those in sets, context sets, <laughs> sets off flames and fireworks yes absolutely yeah. absolutely we, yes we do also have a very active public program involving mainly school children but all the way through to you know adults mm -hmm. and everything so um it would be quite nice for you to kind of organize a talk for you with um our our audiences um i think that would be very, very i'd love to do that i'd love yeah. to do that i can um obviously uh, talking to younger children i would take a slightly different approach because um yeah I, I, you know some of this is very shocking and i don't want to i don't want to head away from that but i think there are ways of explaining all this to younger children and to explain it the thing i'm most concerned about is where it leaves us now because we we in britain have been educated i showed you that slide at the end with the white person uh, because i feel we've been left as the kind of victors um and and we we don't understand how we stripped away everything um and how we actually invented these categories that we now live with and um and why we still need them so that people can get behind them to fight uh, and to to argue and to campaign um i agree so, i agree and but um, I, I would I mean, love just, to talk a bit further i think it, the situation here in the schools is um that slavery and enslavement has is dealt with quite a lot um, yes, in the yes. education program compared with you know with the British amnesia, but um, but it's definitely um, something of you know a huge import all the way through the school school year mm -hmm, school life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, one specific though, if I may, is yes. um, you mentioned the statistic, or, or I think um, uh, our colleague mentioned it, um, Garrick. But it's like mm -hmm. 50, that Scottish merchants accounted for fifty percent of the trade in general. Is that did I hear that correctly? I think um, that's quite 
quite a statistic. And I'm just wondering whether that's um, for the whole period or was it more, um, is it skewed a little bit more towards the latter period where certain, quite a lot of large companies were buying up bankrupt estates um, after, before and after 1807? And um, and I'm you wondering... Asked, yeah. Gary, it, to respond to the point. Yeah, that I'll just made. finish. Just finish the question. Yeah. Um, and also, is that statistic based upon the compensation? Um, so, is that is that kind of like rooted in looking through the legacies of British slavery, you know, and and sort of estimating it on that basis? I'd be, just be very curious whether you or Garrett can address that. It's an interesting question, Jonathan. Um, what I came across was the fact that it's based on um, merchants and traders. And now I couldn't give you a, a timeline as to, you know, whether it was over a 200 year period or a 150 year period. But I, I, I can find out. But clearly, you know, uh, almost 50 percent is a, a very large number when you think of, of Scotland. As, as as separate from England, Wales and Ireland. Um, and, you know, we need to look further as to the Pacific period that that actually equates the, the 50 percent. Um, uh, it's an interesting just, question. Yeah. Mm. Can I just say that at the t in the period we're talking about, Scotland was only about a tenth of the British population, but they were a third at least a third of the, the, the bookkeeper roles and the planters, if not a half, and you're saying possibly more than a half of those who were involved in the, in the, in, in the slave trading in and around. This, that's, that, and that is what, as I dug into things, that's what I began to feel. I began to actually, this is what gave me nightmares, was the idea that actually Scotland was deeply, deeply involved. And every little place that I've been to talk at, I've had a go at digging, and I find yes, the links are there. Yeah, yeah. And, and I... the, the the other thing, David, um, Jonathan, that might be interesting is to to identify, you know, that comparative across um, the whole of the, you know the UK, so we could use that across Wales, uh, England, Ireland, etc. Uh, I'm sure mm, that information mm, exists. Mm, yeah. Mm, uh, I need mm. to I need to consult with my colleague um David Olesua at Manchester University um you know to, to get some some data. Mm. Mm. I just wanted to say something uh, to Vivian to you um because what I what is remarkable what I found remarkable was that having stripped away culture, um, history, um, and, and all of that from in, enslaved people over such a long period. And then we find that modern Jamaica and its place in the world, um, that the images that of, of, um, of white supremacy and black, um, black enslavement, all those images that we've been fed, that we have been fed, um, what what we find now is that the world's best athletes, the music that we all dance to, so much a culture and literature that's come out of one small island, and it's as it's as if they uh, the spirit could never be killed. As if the, is it what the images we've been given, and then actually what's emerged in independent Jamaica? Yes, it's not a wealthy country, but but it's it's produced such a mass of culture such a mass of culture which which yeah. we totally and you look at it and you think such a small island and and so it, when you're saying about people not having education people being up until very even now uh, oppressed because of that history and then you look at the spirit which has never died and is still there uh, it's it's a remarkable thing. Amazing, amazing. Well, pressed the earth pressed against the earth produces minerals, diamonds. Mm. 
and the earth through suffering came. Jai is my keeper, performed at Canterbury Cathedral 2019. Mm. Right. I'll, I'll defer to Lord Crawford on this one. <laughs> but I, just to say that, you know, that I don't think that that, that energy and, and drama too um, is a lot to do with repression and suppression. And so I think we know in Wales and we also know in Scotland and we also know in Ireland that, you know, being located next to a very, very powerful country can kind of like generate a great deal of energy mm -hmm. and passion mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. pride as well. You know, mm -hmm. so it, it's, mm -hmm. I don't think it's just restricted to, to Jamaica, but, you know, all, all small, small nations have had to go through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those who feel it know it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, gosh. Right, we've, we've a couple of guests with us today who um, have not... Uh, said uh, welcome to. We've got Helen Papworth. Helen wrote a brilliant book on um, called The Butterfly and the Bee, the story of um, the wife of Henry Morton Stanley. Um, Helen, it's lovely to have you with us. I don't know if you want to make any comment or... Well, it's just fascinating. Uh, I think, you know, it's kind of built up, you know, information that we've heard before, but with more facts um, that just, you yeah. know, really are surprising very well yeah very well done thank you Kate thank, thank you. you thank you Helen we have Cordelia Wright with us as well Cordelia how are you and where are you from hello um I'm from Islington ah lovely I'm very well thank you for asking <laughs> <laughs> is that Islington um, in Jamaica I know I, 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 I didn't even know there was Islington in Jamaica I mean... <laughs> Mary yes oh, I didn't know that. I'm going to have to start looking at our map tomorrow. Yes, really. yes, 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 yes. Oh, and so we have nice. Campbelltown in Kingston, <laughs> in Venice, so St. Anne. Do <laughs> you? Yeah. Wow. I'm fascinated by how many places we have in Jamaica that are, are, are resemble Great Britain. Like, it's like they've just taken the names and named all of the places there. And, and it, it's just, it fascinates me. I was really fascinated when I found out about there being a Manchester there as well. I was like, what is, what? There's a Manchester? That, was, I, that, that, that really blew my mind. And now you're telling me this. So I'm, I'm going to have a little look after this meeting and uh, really delve into that because there, there's a lot of information about my country that I do not know that I really, or I say my country, my mum and my, my dad and my grandparents uh, in terms of my uh, my whole family. Uh, that's my, my roots. It's my heritage. So I, I should really know more. And thank you so much, Kate, for the wonderful presentation. Um, do you do you have um open days and things as well do you do you do presentations um i'll yeah. do presentations to anybody everybody i'm on a kind of a mission i'm uh, to to um to edge i worked in adult education to a certain extent and i'm 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 retired now but i've got lots of time and this oh, is my cool. project <laughs> I, I just want to talk I, I want to talk to kids I want to I don't want them to my children my grandchildren you know in a broader sense to grow up with the ignorance that I had well um, the other thing I would like to ask you as well would you be willing to come to London next year for absolutely the <laughs> we're trying to organize something it was Roland's that invited me into this meeting I also know Garrick as well I've been mm. I've been being with them um they're wonderful people and thank you very much for inviting me and Roland um but yeah I would like to I'm planning something at the moment for next year to educate people not just about the wind rush but also just about our history so um if it's possible I'd like to stay in touch with you if that's okay yeah and absolutely I'm sure that um Liz can you can give out my contacts yeah, yeah. um okay. I'm quite happy with that um uh, I I would be very happy to um, uh, to talk further with people, and I'm very happy to give talks. I would probably, f um, you know, d d we could we could discuss exactly how you would want things to be presented and what sorts of things you would want presented. Um, today, I particularly wanted to address this question of how we were left with white supremacy, even though we we had the legislation. I felt we won that battle, but we didn't win the propaganda. Uh, and it's still with us. 
It is. Uh, it's quite an unfortunate thing, um, but it's it's wonderful that we have people like yourself uh, educating because education is very important in terms of changing people's minds and their attitudes and, and their behaviour. Um, ignorance is a big factor in the way that a lot of people behave. Um, mm -hmm. It's wonderful that we have educators like yourself um, putting this information out there. Thank you, Cordelia. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Cordelia. Thank you. That's, that's good. Thank I've you. put your email in the chat. If yes, that's okay. yes, I'm quite happy with that. People can contact me whenever they want to. Yeah. Right. I'm going to ask Roland because Roland sometimes has difficulty with the um, uh, communications thing. Roland, are you there? Yeah, good afternoon. I'm here. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I've managed to sort out the um the tinternet as we say up north. The tinternet is sorted Good. now. The tinternet. Good. <laughs> yeah. So yes, it's sort it's sorted now, so I'm good. Um great presentation. I've been listening here. Um very, very especially the food I like to mention of the um the salted fish and so on from Scotland mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. a lot of those food. Um, mm -hmm. are intricate part of Jamaican diet. So, mm -hmm. um, growing up in Jamaica, mm -hmm. the, the salted fish from the um, mm -hmm. the herring, the shad one called shad. Um, mm -hmm. I remember there was an issue with um when I came to UK, um this young lady was telling me, yeah, if you, if you if you move the, the 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 D and replace that D with a G, we know that 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 means. But Barrington, Barrington Levy song, song um, say he just smoked cigarette and strictly shag. Um, shag in Jamaica, I mean, in, it's, it's um, cheap tobacco, roll up. That's, oh, that's yeah. what shag is there. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so and we got a similar situation with shag in Jamaica, which is like at the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. You got the salt fish. Um, which is cod, then you've got the salt mm -hmm. mackerel, which is further down, then mm -hmm. shad is right at the bottom. It's the cheapest of the cheap, really. So mm -hmm. it's quite interesting uh, about yes, the salt. Yes, yes, yes. It, so, it is salt. interesting to know yeah. that that's lived on in the language. Yes, and there are others as well, um, herring as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it, it, it's it's good um, to understand that um, the, the connection of the food and the part it plays um, from the enslaved, uh, the era of enslavement all the way yes. to the end. A lot of that are left. Yes. Even with awful, um, you know, in, in America, you got um, pig trotters, pig foot. Yes. In Jamaica, you got the coed, um, yes. of seal, cow skin, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Now, mm. Um, uh, now it's sort of become trendy to, yes. to, 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 to be um, um, using those food that mm. then was at um, the bottom of the food chain, the bottom of the barrel, so to speak. So, mm. Thank you very much. It's um well pointed um on point um presentation. Thank you. I, I, hope you take, I hope you take take the same energy throughout the country and educate as many as possible of the young young people. Um, not only of um African um African and enslaved descent, but also the the those of the descendants of the enslaved, mm. so mm. to speak. Thank yes. you very much. I'm back to you, Liz. Thank you very much. Much appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Roland. And we've got Cordelia on the chat saying she loves sardines and saltfish. <laughs> what's on herring? Ooh, what's <laughs> fail, she says. <laughs> Went to a Michelin restaurant and they had pig's trotters on the menu. <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> it's interesting. We're, uh, I'll come to you, uh, Garrick, next and then June Elizabeth. Um, we're, we're planning to hope Hopefully, uh, the Welsh Government's provided uh, funding to, for international links. And with those international links, Kate, we're hoping to do something in terms of adult education. So I'll be quite interested to talk with you some more. And I hope this is the beginning of a really um, longer term relationship um, with you because your work is so closely you know so closely aligned to what we're we're trying to do it's just just wonderful and we want to hear more and more and hear how you get on and be able to plan 
with you, perhaps some other things, conferences or whatever, because we're relatively good on Zoom now. Anyway, when we do do our exchange visits, we're hoping to also take a, a Nigerian chef with us because she's really interested to see mm -hmm. the Nigerian um, Jamaican food links, but also she lives in Wales, so she knows the the, mm. the links in, in the UK. So that should be good. Right, okay, we've got two keen people here. Garrett, can you be patient while June Elizabeth takes a turn? Okay, June Elizabeth, you're looking good, like the hat. Oh, thank you very much. Just go with the outfit, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my brother contacted me and said that he'd been nominated for an award and he would like me and my sister to come. I said, when is it? Let me look in my diary. He said, it's today. Anytime he's going to pick me up at quarter to four. And anyway, I just wanted to say, Kate, my husband's buying your book today. I've left him the, <laughs> the job. And without echoing what everyone else has said, that was one of the baddest presentation. We know opposites of meanings, like, mm -hmm. you know, when the English whitewash, black history, mm -hmm. you, we mm -hmm. understand sometimes yeah. things are back to front. And I just wanted to say that was an excellent presentation. And actually, when I go back to university, I can include that in my MA history 1500 to 1750. There was a bit of it there that I can say, you know, put towards my MA. But the final thing I want to say is that I think you're going to be inundated with requests after you leave this platform. Yes, because I've already booked a hall next year and I'm going to see if you might be available and the museum have asked me to um, present and get somebody like yourself to come forward. But I wish you all the best. You thank make you, me feel thank good. You, you make me feel good. My great great grandmother was from Scotland, and that's another story. Have a good weekend. <laughs> all right. Thank you, One June. Love. Nice to meet Bye. you. Yeah. One love. Bye. That's just fantastic. And I, I can see your capability, um, Kate, of, of sharing this story. It's one thing sharing it in Scotland, incredible to be sharing it with those communities on the West Coast, but to have you telling your story in England and in Wales will be quite a different thing. And I think it, it just, because um, there was so much that applied much wider. Okay, Garrett, just you and then Sean's put his hand up as well. Just a quick point, responding to Cordelia um, point. Um, <laughs> wherever the English goes, they leave their mark. So mm -hmm. our little island, you know, Cornwall, Middlesex and Surrey, and all mm -hmm. the parishes that we have, yeah. right, where did they come from? You know, yeah. uh, all yeah. come from, from Britain. And they were named after certain governors, etc., etc. So our history... And, and, and this is why the conversation around black history is so important because, you know, I do not like to separate out, um, you know, uh, black history. It's a, it is a shared history. British history is the same as our own black history. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that, you know, we having to fight in order to be included mm -hmm. in the bigger, yes. wider British history, but it's part of the same thing. Mm. Mm. That's right, Garrick. Thank you so much. Sean, would you like to come in next and then Vivian? Yeah, thanks very much. It was an excellent uh, presentation and I shall be looking forward to reading your book. Um, in terms of um, doing that kind of presentation based on Scotland, into England, um, we have to remember, of course, that the Scots uh, merchants, etc., had enormous links down in London. Um, yes. Many of them bought landed estates in England. Um, and it may be that one way in is to choose a few examples of oh, people yeah. like the Wedderburns, for instance, and their London base. Um, and tell the story, uh, and if you can find something in Northampton where June is, um, but 
and there's been a lot of work done in Northampton, so it may be mm -hmm. quite easy discussion with June to find out whether there were any uh, Scottish links. Um, so it, it's about trying to find ways in which the story you're telling based on Scotland can be linked in and showing how the slavery business, as I call it, um, is just immersed. It, it's everywhere in Britain. It's it's everywhere. And, but we... and the complexity of the economy and the business relationships, etc., um, yes. mean you can link other parts of the country with you you can do links between different parts of the country mm. so mm -hmm. that's it might be a thought uh, something to think about yeah. yeah i think you can always you probably in the way that i have done the more i dig the more i find and in and in that way i'm sure you could you could just as easily dig we've tended to say oh liverpool or bristol these were the but it's it's not confined like that because there were so many shareholders the bristol ships had shareholders in scotland the scottish yeah. the scottish shareholders based themselves it, it it's all it's all they all linked up together but yeah. you can you can ground it in a small place and say this is what built your town this, this is what brought money into your town this is what your townspeople in historically were doing um, and they were involved in it uh, you can it, you have to because it was so widespread it was so enormous that of course they were involved in it yeah absolutely brilliant i just um before i come to you vivian i just checked on the um where uh, where we could buy your book Amazon before. Do you have a preferred supplier, I, Kate? Um, I, I'd, I'd, the, if you go to Lewis Press, my publishers, number yeah. one, you can read the first chapter on their website, uh, but also you can you can buy it from then Lewis Press. Um, probably that's best. I I actually there is an independent bookseller's website, but I'd have to look it up where you can make a donation to an independent independent bookseller but um let's say lewis press at this minute okay well thank you very much indeed for that i'll look that up quickly vivian can i ask you yes, next thank time? you so much liz and thank you to kate and you all for accommodating vivian um kate i have a request mm. um in a few weeks time we will be singing all lang sign mm. new year's eve yes and you are aware that in 1786 Robert Burns was invited by his cousin, That's right. Dr. Boise Douglas, to Jamaica. Yes. And the research is saying, there's an ambivalence there, because the research is saying that his book of poems was published so successful that he decided not to come. I'm yes. now seeing another side of the coin, which states that he was opposed to chattel slavery. That's why he didn't come. How do we resolve that? That's your homework. Sorry. Okay. Okay. But I, it's my it's my personal view. It's my personal view that because it was so accepted by everyone in Scotland at the t it, he 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 lived in a mixed in a community which uh, would have suggested it to him as a good opportunity to make money. Whether he, uh, so, I I rather think he was very tempted to go. Money, it can you make you could earn if you were a carpenter or or, or just a, a fairly simple man. You went to Jamaica at that time; they, you were paid two or three times what you could earn at home. So this is what encouraged people to go. There was there were big incentives. But why he didn't, but why he didn't turn up? They contend mm. that it was because of the uh, um, enslavement. He aborted, it, so he, he you know he, he didn't come. I'd like to believe that, but I don't. <laughs> I'd like yeah. to believe it, but I'm sorry, I don't. I, I... Sing all along, saying it. Well, you're making <laughs> you're making me think that as well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you, Liz. Actually, can I, uh, Liz? Can I come in on that? Yes. Uh, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. One of the greatest fans of Robert Burns and Burns Nights and Old Lang Syne is Maya Angelou. Um, and I'm sure she must have written an essay on Burns. Um, she must have. Um, I was at a Burns event, which she was at several years ago. I can't even remember whether it was in Scotland or England. And she was definitely a 100% supporter of Burns and uh, uh, has written something that actually has can tell us a bit more about. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. Anyway, her interpretation as an African-American uh, of Burns is um, not going to Jamaica. <laughs> he obviously didn't hold it against him. No. All right, I'm busy here checking on your uh, website. I haven't found the book yet, but I'll I'll get there. Um, but it is uh, there. There is certainly a, um, a a generous amount to read as well on the Amazon um, site too, which has given me an insight into your book. I haven't got my copy over here yet, and I'm I prefer to get a real book. <laughs> to, yes, you can have it. You to. can get it for a Kindle, I think. Kindle, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I think this is the beginning of um a beginning of a friendship. Um, I hope you'll take an interest in what we're attempting to do. I, I, I will indeed. I will indeed. Um, I will indeed. Because we are bringing together people with sometimes join we've got a professor in nigeria joss who joins us professor sati sometimes uh and mm -hmm. there are ways now that the world is changing and books can be made available to people in different countries much more easily and that's one of the issues so absolutely brilliant it's just wonderful to see uh, my colleague jonathan greenland here with us as well jonathan we really you know, going going hard on trying to get some Welsh government funding for these exchange visits, which you may have heard about, but I'll make sure that you know it too. And um, thank you so much, Vivian, for joining us as, uh, this morning as well. It's your morning there. And thanks to all the rest of you for all your places around the, around the UK. And um, if that's all right. And, and Vivian, uh, it's a tradition in Jamaica um, to have a prayer when we have a meeting and perhaps I might ask you to finish this meeting with a prayer. Thank you so much Liz and this morning I thank you. I want to close with a prayer which was left on the moon in 1969. Um, the uh, uh, prayer written by James Dillett Freeman, uh, Unity Minister in the United States and when Buzz um, was going on the, the moon, he attended the church service and he was given this poem, this prayer, and he left it on the moon. And every time we see the moon, we know the moon is there. I want us all to remember this prayer, prayer for planet Earth. So let us pray the prayer. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, well, Kate, uh, I hope your uh, rest of your um weekend goes okay and uh, good luck with all that you're doing we really really thank you for joining us it's really been it's been actually it's been an uplifting session because <laughs> it's just so good to hear somebody who just talks it straight like it was you know <laughs> pussyfooting around and uh, thank you Vivian and Jonathan especially for joining us from uh, from Jamaica and it's just brilliant that we've also got um uh, the rest of our colleagues here so thanks a lot thanks Cordelia for joining us we hope to see you again and um, Joan and Helen so that's excellent all right I'll get off to bed now all right thanks, Liz. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Kate, as well. Liz, 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 Liz. Thank you. Uh, bye then. Bye. Liz is our nice tower. Nice to see you all. <laughs> Liz, you are our tower. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to meet you.